how's it going? Pretty good. How you doing? Doing well. Thanks so much for doing this. Good. Are uh, you ready for your 73 questions? I am. All right. Let's, uh, let's jump right in. What is your name? Uh, Dr. Lan Van Taylor. And where did you grow up? Uh, Brentwood, Long Island. And what kind of doctor are you? I'm a physiatrist, which means physical medicine and rehabilitation physician. And how many years have you been in practice? Roughly 10. Did you know as a kid that you wanted to be a doctor? I did. What did you study in college? Uh, I was a chemistry major. And did you take any time off before starting med school? I 100% did. What did you do for med school? Where did you go? What Before med school? Uh, where did you go to med school? Oh, uh, Rowan University, which at that time was called uh, UMDNJ. Who would you say was your most memorable professor at SLM? Hmm, gonna say, that's a good one. Who was my most memorable uh, professor? I am going to say, final answer, let's come back to that one. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. How does it feel All right, go back. I'm going to say Dr. German and Chanel. Okay. Mm -hmm. How does it feel being a professor at your alma mater? Uh, it's great. It's great to be able to uh, give back and kind of see where you were and where you've uh, kind of uh, progressed to. Did you always see yourself practicing academic medicine? Uh, yeah. Where did you complete your core clerkships when you were a third-year student? So we did them at Our Lady of Lords and uh, the Kennedy System, which is now Jeff. What and Lords is now Virtua. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what would you say was the toughest rotation for you? I don't think I had any tough rotations. I, I really was somebody that I took three years off between college and med school, and I really like we just dove deep into it. I found all of it stimulating. Did you do any research when you were in med school? I did. I believe I did a uh, – there was a – I participated in this uh, trial where they were looking at OMM and how it affected the need for opioids. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the one thing that stands out the most from your time at SLM? Um, I, I would think just the collaborative nature of the student body. I was on Stuco, and um, you know, the, uh, we just had a very tight knit uh, student body. Um, I, I felt like that that informed my studying, I, and I always used to say it's not just how you study, but how you buddy. Not, not just how you study, but how you study. Mm -hmm. And that ends up becoming important, like, and you can call it networking or social capital as you move ahead, ahead in life. But it's one of those things where um, you can figure out something, everything yourself, or you can go to people who have the knowledge and uh, just, you know, use the time more effectively. Absolutely. So aside from a couple of name changes, of course, how would you say that someone has changed since you were in school? Well, it's grown and blossomed significantly. Um, I mean, the, the class size, the faculty, um, and the opportunities um, that are available here. What kind of doctor did you think you were going to be when you started school? I thought I was going to be ob -GYN. I'm going to sit right here. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you settle on PM&R? Well, um, and interestingly enough, my sister's an ob -GYN physician, um, but um, when I began to look at PMNR, um, I was a lot more fascinated um, by what the field offered in terms of uh, breadth and collaboration with other specialties uh, than ob -GYN. Um, And that's not to say that ob is not a great field. I, I uh, just, it, it, the PMNR spoke to me more. What would you say is the most unique thing about PMNR? Well, I, I think it's the collaborative nature. You're always reaching out and getting input um, from whether it's neurosurgery, ortho, um, and you're advocating for your patients in a way um, that I feel like other um, other um, specialties don't have to. Um, you know, one of the things is we f tend to focus on function um, as just as opposed to like you know just like the illness at hand. So sometimes that's you know we do a lot of uh, peer to peers and kind of advocating. Um, uh, via our professional organizations for, you know, treatments and, and um, things that will impact the lives of our patients. How long was your residency training? It was four years. It was, I did a transitional year, and then I did a three-year uh, PM&R residency at Temple. What would you be doing right now if you hadn't gone into medicine at all? I don't know. I'm not good at anything else. Um, you know, I would probably have uh you know your typical nine to five before i went to med school i worked in a group home uh, for developmentally disabled children um and i like kids so so maybe something in a capacity 
of uh, maybe a teacher. Is there a common stereotype about EMNR? Well, I think a lot of people have the impression that it's plenty of money and relaxation. Um, it's kind of a, a cushy lifestyle. Um, and, you know, I think what's important to understand is that any specialty can be a grind or it can be as cushy as you make it. I think a lot of it has to deal with, uh, you know, what you sign up for. Um, so, for example, I know PM&R doctors uh, and they, you know, like their job, but it's a grind. They, you know, will have a census of up to, you know, maybe, you know, 25, 30 people and their multiple discharges and admissions and meetings in, in a day. So, you know, you're constantly moving. How do you typically get ready for work? Uh, I wake up at 430. I go for a run or go to the gym. I have a smoothie. Um, and then I get in the car and I listen to some type of either music or podcast that's uh, inspirational. I think it's important to, um, particularly nowadays where we have all of this accent to whatever accent access to all of this content, um, that we make sure a good amount of, for me anyway, that I, I make sure a good amount of it is inspiring and, and informative. So oftentimes, like I, you know, I, I like to run. So I'm listening to podcasts about people who've achieved goals and that effect, or I'm listening to something that has to do with a uh, learning objective for, you know, a, a board certification or something like that. And one of the things I would say to students out there that becomes, that's interesting to me is I, I never thought, I always looked at studying as a labor um, and it's one of those things now where I look at it that it's, it, it, it more impacts my, my daily life. So it just, it just, I'm not studying for a test. I'm studying to get better, um, if, you, if, if that makes any sense. And it's different. The motivation becomes different and the reward, become, the reward becomes different when you're more capable in your day-to-day in your -day, uh, tasks. Absolutely. So where, where do you work now? We're here in your office. Well, yeah. What is this place? This is the Neuromusculoskeletal Institute at Rowan University. And here we... Uh, have a number of different uh, services that we provide. Um, there's musculoskeletal medicine that ranges from everything from doing um, OMM to uh, intraarticular joint injections to pain management involving um, all types of modalities, including um, opioid medication, as well as treating individuals who have uh, substance use disorder. What are some of the multidisciplinary approaches that you to your patients that have either chronic pain or substance use disorders? So, I mean, one of the things that I'm tasked with is a lot of times I get a patient and they have chronic pain. And what I have to do is kind of figure out what the pain generator is. And so in doing that, I'm working with radiologists if I have to say, hey, I look, there's an L4-5 disc herniation. Um, I, I need to correlate this with some symptoms that the patient is having. Or, hey, this patient has a uh, foot drop, and I think this is getting progressive. Getting on the phone with a neurosurgeon and saying, um, you know, what do you think here? Is this something where I could potentially send them for an injection and this, and this gets better? Or do you think you really need to go in there and, and cut out the space occupy and lesion to preserve, you know, axons? What role do goals and goal setting have in the care you provide to your patients here at NMI? Oh, it's a hundred percent important because what you what I always say is I try to I, I hate to overpromise and underdeliver. So you know, setting expectations and setting the bar of what's possible and what's probable, and um, being comfortable with maybe not being able to give some give somebody the answer that they want. Um, but it's the truthful, most accurate um, answer that serves them the best. What motivated you to practice medicine at, at NMI? So what motivated me to practice medicine at NMI uh, was Dr. German. I uh, interviewed here and um, he sold me on, the, uh, on, on what he had built here. In your role, do you see patients in the hospital as well as the clinic? Uh, no, I occasionally see patients at uh, skilled nursing facilities. How long is a typical shift for you at work? Usually I get in here somewhere around 7.30 and I'm leaving somewhere, you know, I'd say before 5. And what's the first thing you do when you get to work? Uh, interact with my staff. I'm a super, I'm a social butterfly um, and I thrive off of uh, 
you know, getting my people fixed. So, you know, how's everything going, getting some coffee, doing a little bit of joking and yucking it up. And then, you know, looking at the schedule and see how we're going to tackle today. I work very closely and couldn't do what I do without the support of the staff here. They're an integral part. They're part of the infrastructure with regard to, to monitoring and communication with our patient base. So I think it's important that uh, we that the doctors and the staff uh, feel feel like they're, you know, that the staff are an extension of the doctors. Um, because I think that works the best. Do you have a set work schedule or do your hours change depending on what you're doing? Preset. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do PM&R physicians take call? Yes. Above all others, what tool would you say you use more than anything else as a PM&R doctor? This is going to sound corny, but, uh, you know, your empathy and, and your heart. Sometimes, as I was saying before, you're giving people uh, tough to swallow information. Um, you may have to tell people that, listen, you know, the best that I can do for you is control your symptoms. But um, the, the goal that you have, which may be to walk again or to assume a prior life role, is, is not something that's on the table at this point with where medicine and, and the current state of things is. Um, but I'm going to, you know, try to work with you um, to, to make whatever your new normal is um, the best that it can be. And uh, I think everybody gets school, everybody can do the, the boards and, and, and things like that. I think being able to connect with people uh, in that way is probably my talent. What sort of procedures do you get to do in PMI? So I do uh, a lot of ultrasound guided procedures. So I do a lot of joint injections, tendon injections, um, up to OMM, up to uh, in procedures that you would do uh, for individuals with substance use disorder. So that's me. Um, then you can even get more interventional where you're using a C-arm and you're doing spinal procedures and, and things of that nature. Um, you're, you can uh, fill pumps and, and medical devices that are used uh, for pain management. Now, you're one of the clerkship directors for the Neuromuscular Medicine and Pain Management Mm -hmm. What do you hope students take away from that rotation? The biggest thing, and we talk about this whenever I get some downtime with them, as I understand that not everybody is going to go into pain management, um, but as physicians, we're all responsible for being able to uh, appropriately, adequately, and responsibly treat the pain of our patients. So, you know, having a primer and not necessarily just having to say, well, go see pain management because this is, uh, this is more than just a three-day um you know, an issue that requires a three-day course of medication. Also understanding that there, there are options other than, you know, your opioids. And so, like, you know, some of the interventional procedures that we talk to and, and making sure that you understand what the actual uh, genuine pain generator is. Um, because you can have somebody, and if you think it's just muscle strain and somebody has, uh, you know, radiculopathy, um, you're, you're, you're not serving that patient to the best of your ability. Um, what do you like to ask medical students when they first show up on rotation? Where are you from? What do you want to do? Uh, and pretty much it's where you're from, what do you want to do? And so, yeah, go ahead. The question that I like to ask everybody mm. is does pineapple belong on pizza? I'm very passionate about this. Yeah, it, there, it, it depends on the context. Sounds good. What's something that you've learned recently? Hmm. Does it have to be a medicine thing? Not at all. Okay. So I probably am a product of the, you know, American high school. And even though I didn't play collegiate sports university system, that I think traditionally is more a no pain, no gain uh, type of when it comes to athletic training. Sure. And a lot of, I'm, so I talk about, I listen to these podcasts and I study all of these things. And, you know, with the exception of those who are on performance enhancing drugs, um, it turns out that um, intensity um, should only be a variable in your training uh, uh, toolbox and that consistency and developing a strong base uh, pretends better outcomes long, 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 in the long term. So for example, it, it's better to go out there and I forgot who said this, but to be um, consistently good than occasionally great. And I think that also, like, forget athletics, right? It probably, that, that also transfers into, like, you know, uh, medical school and your job and reliability and things of that nature. Absolutely. So within PM&R, what are your professional and research interests? So I'm interested in looking at 
how we can continue to safely and responsibly uh, prescribe medication for those who need it, um, and how we can kind of better understand the uh, overlap and intersection between uh, chronic pain and opioid use disorder, because uh, they are n not necessarily the distinct entities um, that traditionally medicine saw them as, and there's, there's a, a significant amount of gray area and overlap um, in, underst in understanding our populations. What would you say is the most challenging part about your job? Hmm. What is the most challenging part about my job? I don't know. What would you say is the most rewarding part of your job? Working with the students um, and being able to, you know, see the eureka, I get it moment um, when something is not absolutely clear. And I guess, you know, working with students can be challenging too. I'll, I'll do the flip side of that coin where, you know, one of the things that happens as you're in medicine, and I've been a, you know, attending physician for close to 10 years, is that, you know, you get more and more knowledge every year and your students come in at the same place. So, you know, oftentimes I have to check in and say, you know, are they, where are they at right now? Do you have to know something that, I, that may be elementary to me? Um, but, you know, it's elementary because I learned it, you know, 13 years ago. Um, and so I think that's something that, uh, to, to keep in my mind. What's a memorable patient that you've encountered recently? Hmm. Let's see. How can I say this without involving HIPAA? Um, I'll say this. Um, one of the things that really touched me is... I had a, uh, uh, my wife had a four, we had a four month old baby and the amount of questions um, that patients give me and like, hey, how's the baby doing and everything like that. Um, you know, it, it shows that like, you know, that there's a, you know, connection there beyond just something that's transactional. Congratulations on the baby. Mm -hmm. um, what word do you think that your patients would use to describe you? What's a word that means, I guess, energetic? Maybe hyper. <laughs> what word would your students use to describe it? Um, probably energetic, hyper, talkative, uh, energizer bunny. Uh, you know, it's it, it particularly on um, when we're when in, in the NMI, and it's like, you know kind of my own uh, you know backyard. What's a fact that people might be su surprised to learn about you? Don't know if they'd be surprised. I think people here know it, but I'm a fan of, of languages. Um, so I study like languages. I try to speak uh, and to varying degrees of success, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, and French. Um, I lived in a university town um, for a couple of years and I was able to take advantage of some of the language arts professors there and develop like cultivate relationships where they were these relationships in these other languages. And it was like, you know, so super cool. And I'm also a big dork. Um, I think that, um, you know, appearances, maybe I appear like a dork. I don't want to presume <laughs> anything, but, uh, you know, might not think that a lot. But I, I also, when um, things are not too busy uh, academically, uh, like like to read, um, and I'm a fan of, and like English too, I'm a fan of just like words and definitions and, and things of that nature because one of the things that uh, really impressed me uh, when I went to college is kind of the level of vocabulary that some of my peers had um, at the age that I was at. And I realized that that was attained not by um, learning vocabulary for a test, but like reading a lot and being able to incorporate um, some of those uh, fancier words in the way that you speak and the way that you write. Well, if I'd known that you spoke a few different languages, I would have included some questions in some different languages for you, but next time. You can test me, see if I'm, <laughs> see if I'm full of it. So you, you ran the Philly Half Marathon in November, right? How I did. did. How did that go? It was great. I ran it, uh, and um, I mean, it's one of those things where, um, and I have to be careful because I get super excited, but it's one of those things where like training for the ma half marathon or one of these things is not the fun part. The fun part is the actual race day because it's a party and it feels like you're the guest of honor and the whole city is cheering for you. And, you know, well, you know, and, and, and it is right. The runners are kind of the, uh, the guest of honor. It's a, it's a cool feeling. So do you have any plans to run another half anytime? Running AC, running AC in 
April. There's an AC April Fool's Day marathon, and I, uh, I owe that one something um, because I got negative and I let a seed of doubt grow, and so I have to go back there and uh, reclaim what I left there. Okay, good. good and luck. a full one, we'll see. Uh, I, I, I romanticize maybe one, so definitely New York and maybe one day Paris. Okay. If you were a professional athlete, what song would you choose for your entrance? Oh, it'd be Rocky. It wouldn't even be a song. Okay. It would be like Rocky II, um, training montage, Adrian's in the hospital, and she says win. What's your favorite sport to play? Basketball. Favorite sport to watch? Basketball. What was your first ever job? So I worked for the Police Athletic League. I think I was 14, and they had this summer program where you would sell coupon booklets going door to door. What would you say motivates you the most? I don't know. I, I think achievement. I think, you know, um, I'm still kind of hooked on that, you know, whether you're four years old and you, and you finally figure out how to tie your shoes that like I did it. I think that's, yeah, that's, you know, that motivates me. What scares you? Mm. I'm not really scared of anything. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know lightning. <laughs> uh, you know, getting hit by a bus. I don't. You know, I don't. I, I don't know. What about what frustrates? Uh, tons of things frustrate me. Um, you know, it. Uh, you know, healthcare uh, today can be challenging. Um, it is. Uh, you know, yeah. You know, it can be. It can be challenging. Whether it's paperwork, whether it's navigating different systems and things of that nature. You said you're a big reader. Can you tell me about a, a book that you've read recently? Yes. And so I'm, and it's a book that I'm doing horrible reading um, because uh, one of the staff here, like I said, I'm cool with all the staff. I try to engage. She, I recommended a book to her. She read it in, I don't know, three months. She recommended a book to me. I'm reading it, but it's, so I'm, I'm stubborn and I want to sit down with it. It's taken me two years, but it's called The Goldfinch. Uh, and I got like a hundred pages left, but then, you know, things happen. Like I run a half marathon or I have a four month old daughter or, you know, I have a, a whatever patient volume and things like that. And then I'm like, I look at this book and it mocks me from my nightstand. What is a skill that you wish you had or were better at? Mm. So I probably wish I was a better dancer. Um, but I, I love to dance. So, you know, it's, I don't know if you remember Elaine from Seinfeld or, or that episode, but yeah, I'm the type of person that like, you know, somebody should tell him that he can't dance, um, but he loves to dance. Is there a skill that most people would be surprised to know that you have? Mm, cook. I'm a, uh, I would consider myself, I think I got my wife uh, with cooking. If you could change one thing in medicine today, what would it be? Mm, I would just streamline things. Uh, I would give a little bit more uh, autonomy back to the doctors. What would you say to someone that's getting ready to apply to medical school right now? I would say just, you know, I think medicine is a great field. It can be completely rewarding, um, but to be mindful of what your, uh, what the underpinnings are and what your motivations are. Make sure that you're, you know, you're doing it for you. What would you say to someone that's about to start clerkship? Um, that it can be like drinking from a fire hose, but just keep drinking, you know, you're not going to be able to, to, to swallow it all, but that's, that's, you know, it'll, it'll, you'll, you'll get, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll get better. What would you say to someone that's getting ready to transition to residency? Same thing. Remember clerkships and, uh, it'll get better. Also stay humble. So now you have this doctor title. Uh, after your name, and so like, even though you're now doctor so and so, just you know, uh, treat the staff, uh, you know, other people in the hospital, in the office, with the same amount of humility um, that you always have. What do you see yourself doing after medicine? Mm. Traveling, you know, uh, you know, I, I have this idea of um, putting my daughter in a school where she can like. The thing with me is I'm like, you know, conversational or to a certain extent fluent. And I would love her at this point just to be native uh, so that she can. It's just a different type of gear that I think people have. Like I have to think when I'm speaking in another language and stuff like that. I would I would love it for her to be able to just kind of it's, it's interesting because I feel like when why it appeals to me is I feel like I have a whole different persona 
in you know in when I'm you know if I'm in Portugal and I'm speaking you know it's uh, it's hard to explain but it's a uh, it's a whole different kind of way of being. I, I wish more people would uh, could be able to experience like what it is to be able to you know to communicate in different planes. Now my last question is: What would you say to the aspiring physiatrist? Good luck. Uh, the field needs you, uh, and advocate for your patients. All right, Dr. Taylor, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you.